So the quality of knowledge graphs, as we have learned in my previous video, is a thorny issue. It is very hard to define what we even mean by it. And it will depend on your application, on your goals and requirements, how you want to approach this topic. Nevertheless, uh, once you have made a decision on what is part of your quality uh, understanding, it would of course be helpful if you had some tools and some helpers to actually um, check for the quality uh, that you are looking for. So this video is going to show you some technologies and to mention at least some technologies that are available to this end. Um, and I'm going to talk about checking knowledge graph quality here. So <clears throat> welcome back. My name is Markus Krutsch and these are the videos on uh, the knowledge graph course at TU Dresden. So quality checking basic approaches. Um, <clears throat> quality criteria can be assessed in many ways. And um, this topic actually has um, some um, relationship with the notion of evaluation in research. So um, checking quality uh, is not so different from conducting an experiment, from conducting an empirical study that will give you results on um, how certain uh, things are, how good something is. And uh, similar to um, the goal of researchers, you usually want to have an objective, uh, reliable and unbiased uh, account of how things really are in your organization, in your company, in your efforts. Um, so <clears throat> this is not so different from uh, finding uh, experimental ways uh, to uh, research, um, if you want, the quality of a, a certain artifact. Right. So <clears throat> in this sense, we have uh, still a number of setups we can try in order to approach quality, depending on the uh, exact uh, um, requirements that we start with. A big class of checks that you can do are manual. So these checks are performed by human experts. I was saying often we want to check quality automatically, but in many cases, the uh, assessment of experts is much more valuable and can give you uh, a much deeper information of where you're going right and where you're going wrong. Especially when you start with a new knowledge graph project, it is um, compulsory to include experts, stakeholders in your organization, talk with them um, and figure out um, whether you are serving their needs with the, with the uh, projects that you're doing here. And uh, you cannot reduce that to some automated tests that you run. So um, this is indeed the first and uh, maybe most uh, basic kind of uh, manual check you could do. You go to experts and you ask them for their feedback. This is necessarily subjective, um, but it is also often very informative. For example, you could interview domain experts for completeness and correctness. So if you want to figure out whether these functional requirements of completeness and correctness are sufficiently present in your data, um, you usually will have to talk to someone who knows uh, or who can give you more idea of what should be in there. Um, they can also give you, of course, information about many other topics that uh, might be relevant regarding the utility of the resource. So this is subjective and manual. You can also have manual measures which are more objective um, based, for example, on clearly defined criteria. Um, one way is to start your project by defining use cases or user stories, as they are sometimes called. And then as you go along, you check if these use cases can be realized in the application context. This is a bit similar to how requirements are phrased for software projects. You start with some kind of idea, some high level goals of which should become possible by the technology. And then as you go along, you will uh, put check marks next to these stories to f once you have achieved this functionality by um, the progress that you have made so far. Again, this is mostly useful for uh, initial development. When you have nothing, then you can use such stories to plan, for example, the uh, order in which you will add functionality, just like you do for software projects. <clears throat> okay, and still this is manual because there's no automated way to really tell you whether a particular application uh, of your data is now possible or not. This has to be assessed by an expert. Okay, so these are the manual um, 
approaches that I wanted to mention here. Of course, you can also have automated checks in addition or instead of the manual ones. Um, what could be an automated check? Well, for example, you could have a operational, as I call it here, um, so implementation-based, script-based, ad hoc implementation of quality checks. So you just make up some auxiliary software which executes some check and then uh, does something based on this, your own little reporting tool or whatever. So for example, there could be a script that retrieves matching data from another third-party database and compares the value of this data with the values in your knowledge graph to flag errors, to point out potential problems, or to see if they are in a certain range of closeness to one another, which might be justified in your application. <clears throat> so this can take any form, of course, and is essentially then uh, simply a custom program. And uh, of course, you can see that if you um, take this very far and you do this approach for many cases, you will end up with a large collection of scripts that um, may be very hard to maintain and which might have overlapping uh, checks. And so it's uh, not maybe the best or most scalable approach uh, in order to uh, ensure quality in the long run. <clears throat> Another approach you could take is uh, declarative. Um, so instead of writing a program that does something and reports back a value or a, an error report, as it might be, you um, rather uh, use a specification of quality criteria, which is in some formal machine interpre interpretable language that can be evaluated using standard tools. So instead of writing your own program, you just write a specification that will be used by a program. And this is usually a bit more maintainable, a bit more scalable, because the specification is in a language which is hopefully well documented and which could be evaluated with as a number of different tools. So uh, this is not quite uh, so ad hoc uh, as a script might be when, uh, you know, when the employee who wrote the script leaves, nobody knows anymore what it has been doing. This shouldn't happen if you have a declarative specification. <laughs> the typical example of such specifications are schema documents that constrain the syntax of a knowledge graph. So this could be a um, fully declarative way of specifying things. I will say a bit more about these. Okay. Now, what you can see here, especially for the second category, is that this distinction between operational and declarative is often quite fuzzy. We tend to prefer declarative over operational because, as I said, with declarative approaches, the meaning is somehow removed or uh, separated from the concern of um, how to run it over your knowledge graph. And this has some maintainability advantages that I already mentioned. It also has deployability advantages because as your knowledge graph grows, you may find that the script that you initially used to go through your RDF file is no longer the right way of checking these things. And you may need to go to a cloud-based um, process which uh, runs on a distributed database management system instead. And if you have a declarative specification that is used in each case, you can make sure that the new distributed process is still doing the same checks because it's using the same specification. Whereas if you have a little shell script, it's going to be very hard to um, fully understand it, uh, find out what it should be doing, and then re-implement the whole function on another platform. Mm. <clears throat> okay, so declarativity is good, but it's not always clear wh what is declarative and what isn't. As I already said, a script is certainly very operational. It's famously uh, said that it's easier to port a shell than to port a shell script. And uh, there's a lot of truth in this, right? So um, rewriting programs for another platform is, is very painful and hard. Um, on the other hand, if you have a schema document in, a, in an industry standard like XML schema, this is fully declarative. There is public documentation, what it's supposed to mean. There are standard libraries to it, interpret it that you can run on many platforms and they are somewhat well tested so they are guaranteed to do the same thing in most cases um, so this is fully declarative but of course in practice there's a lot of things in between um, <clears throat> for example often graph database constraints are used so many databases have some constraint support you can uh, impose certain requirements, but uh, how you do that might be in a proprietary language, which is specific to that one database. And this may or may not be portable to another database. So for example, if you use Neo4j, you can 
specify things on a high level without knowing yet how Neo4j will actually check them. So it's roughly declarative for you. You are not programming it, but it's still um, the meaning is still depending on the particular software product that you're working with. And so it's also operational in this sense. <clears throat> Wikidata has that too. Wikidata has property constraints. These are community developed uh, constraints that are stated on the uh, site itself in the, um, on the property pages usually, um, and that express certain schema information in data encodings. This is also largely declarative. You can write different tools to evaluate this. There's some documentation, but of course it's not quite the same as a, as a fully standardized um, and fixed and versioned uh, schema language like xml schema where you could say okay i'm talking about xml schema version 1.1 here and this is how i want this to be interpreted and if i change that in the future i will specify that so this is not how wikidata property constraints work they are more um, defined specified and also refined as people go along <clears throat> you could have sparkle test queries so you could run queries to see if the results they return are what you expect not just in Sparkle, also in other query languages, depending on what you use for your graph. And um, these are also declarative. Queries if themselves are usually declarative. There's not a full program in them, um, but you still need some kind of operational wrapper to check whether the result was what you expected it to be. So in this sense, it is uh, not a fully declarative approach. And there are other approaches, business rules, for example, where you have a kind of declarative programming language to uh, check and uh, certain conditions and then these are interpreted by proprietary software. So declarativity is not a rigorously defined feature but more like an ideal to strive for. The more declarative the better uh, in many cases, yes. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, what concrete methods on top of this can I offer you for checking quality? Um, there's some approaches that are um, more conceptual in a sense that they give you some um, approach that you might use to ensure quality and uh, maybe the most prominent among these is uh, what is called competency questions this this approach has been advocated in the context of ontology development which is a similar knowledge artifact which is <clears throat> a bit more focused on uh, terminological information than on um, instance level information as we have in knowledge graphs but many things are similar in these uh, artifacts and <clears throat> the idea with these competency, que competency questions is that uh, you phrase a usually application related so usually functional question towards the knowledge graph that is formalized in some query language <clears throat> together with a formal specification of how an acceptable answer may look so um, there could be different technical realizations of this idea but the idea is that you have a catalog of questions each question is technologically somehow encoded formalized in some declarative way hopefully in some for example in a query language and then the answer that you expect is also described in some way and the description of the answer does not always have to be the exact set of results that you expect because working like this might mean that your competency question catalog has to have a full copy of your data in the end right if you if you just say for all interesting questions um, what exactly the answers should be then it's like specifying your data indirectly that wouldn't help very much um, but you can have more high level specifications for example it uh, is possible that uh, you should you want to know have that wikidata knows uh, in quotes <clears throat> that humans item q5 are mammals item q7377 um, and uh, so you would require that the sparkle query select star where wikidata q5 is in a connection of p171 star to wikidata q7377 returns a non-empty result which i interpret as true so there should be a p177 path from the humans to the mammals p177 is the um, taxonomy of um, the uh, uh, living organisms so somehow humans should be an organism that is a mammal if you specify it like this you require that the knowledge has 
the competence to answer this question, whether humans are mammals or not. But at the same time, you do not require in detail how exactly humans are mammals, how uh, this is modeled and uh, what exactly is in this taxonomic hierarchy. So which other intermediate levels uh, of uh, specifications there are between a human and a mammal. So there might be apes somewhere in here or whatever else there is until you reach the mammal. <clears throat> and uh, so this is possible just to give you an idea of how this could um, work in practice. Now, as I said, competency questions focus on functional metrics. So they can be used to investigate coverage and completeness. So you cannot check all cases, as I said, but you can check some. You can check that the number of countries you have in your database is actually the correct number or that it matches another number that you also have in the data. Um, they can check for correctness, of course, and they can also indirectly check for accessibility. Because if you have a competency question that you can formalize, it also means that there is a way to put it into a query. And um, if you put it in a query, you already guarantee that if the answer is there, then it's there in an accessible way. There's different ways of using competency questions. It's a possible starting point again for such a project. So you could, before you even start to enter any data or get together um, people or resources to build such a knowledge graph, you could, um, uh, sit down with stakeholders and try to phrase important competency questions to uh, define the initial scope, so to speak, the requirements of the whole project. So that would be one way of using this to say, okay, what kind of information should we eventually get out of this um, resource once we have it? <clears throat> you can also use these uh, questions to formalize certain data modeling decisions, because um, if you fix the query, for the data, you also have um, a requirement of how the information is stored, not just that it is there, but also that it is there in a certain uh, graph structure. And this can also be helpful. So you can uh, use this to nail down the modeling decisions that you have taken along the way. And um, the fourth um, aspect, that, uh, third aspect, sorry, that I have here is uh, regression testing. Yes, So uh, once you have some resource set up and it's growing and being worked on, uh, then you still want to make sure that it doesn't uh, reduce in quality, that it doesn't lose capabilities, which it has had before. And for this, you need tests and um, competency questions are very nice for this because they can be executed automatically if you have um, put them into a technical format uh, where you can simply execute queries to answer them. <clears throat> um, of course, um, this is all nice and good, but there is, as always, uh, in such quality uh, measures, there is going to be a cost. You have to model this first, you have to maintain the questions, you have to adjust the questions if something changes in how you do things. Okay, right, but um, still, I think an, um, a very general, generic approach that can be used in many places. <clears throat> it also connects men spiritually and uh, ideally to something that you know from software development, namely unit testing. Yeah? So competency question um, are very content oriented, as I said, uh, very functional, very application specific, but the approach can be also generalized to uh, have any kinds of tests which you can verify with query um, checks. So what you would do, you define a test suite of queries plus uh, <clears throat> expected answers or at least constraints on these expected answers. So you would somehow uh, have some requirements maybe without being fully specific about what the answer should be. And um, then you can automatically run that regularly to figure out if there are problems. And with this approach, in, in this full generality, you can also validate non-functional criteria. So there's no requirement that this is only used for competency questions. You could also check whether, for example, every property has a label in German with such a query. So that's um, <clears throat> something which is a non-functional requirement, but it's maybe a style guide that you have. Okay, so um, unit testing to some extent also works. And um, this brings us to the um, second and last uh, big uh, portion of this video, namely schema languages. Because once you have uh, found that the um, 
thing that you want to do is uh, basically query answering with certain checks. You can start to think about whether it isn't possible to somehow um, make a, a technical framework to do this work for you. So do you really have to implement your own test harness to check unit tests using Sparkle queries? Or is there maybe already some uh, way um, in which you could do that? <clears throat> and indeed there is, uh, at least to a certain extent, and uh, it is there in the form of schema languages for knowledge graphs. Um, this is in a way the most formal way of defining criteria um, that specify certain structural requirements on um, a knowledge model. Example, I have already mentioned XML schema is a well-known schema language um, that constrains the form of XML documents. Uh, DTT, D, DTD is another uh, such schema language for XML that's a bit older, but has similar goals. So these languages can be used to describe the format of XML data and uh, therefore to communicate how uh, a certain XML structure should look when you uh, work with this data format. Now, what can we do with graphs? Knowledge graphs are not XML, so we need something different. And <clears throat> for RDF, there are indeed two different solutions available um, towards this goal. The first is called Shackle, uh, which is a W3C standard since 2017. And the second is called Shex, which is a W3C member submission and community group effort. So that seems strange. W3C has two different schema languages for RDF. Um, they used to be one. They had a, a common working group, but then there was some disagreement of how to go about. And then part of the group left and split off and the rest was doing shackle and made it a standard whereas the people who left founded a new community group this is also possible it's not quite a standardization but at least it is uh, somewhat organized and official under the umbrella of w3c and they uh, drafted their own documents and made own specifications of how such a schema language could look and uh, okay which of the two will be prevail or whether they will coexist or whether none of them is used i think it's still a bit early to to judge um but right now both are available and there are i guess at least some tools around to check them also um that might still be um uh, not so easy to find in full generality of these standards um because somehow in particular shekel even though it is a standard doesn't seem to have also produced uh, scalable tools. Normally, when for standards, is normally a requirement. So in the standardization groups of WCC, where I have been active, there was always a um, very strict uh, uh, criterion for getting through candidate recommendation phase that, that you have uh, several independent implementations that um, pass a large number of test cases that, and really show that the standard is implementable. Um, I'm not sure how exactly Shackle passed that. I, uh, at least today, I don't know a, a standard tool that you would just take and use if you want to use Shackle. Uh, it's not necessarily better for checks, but this is not a standard, so they didn't have to go through candidate recommendation. So there I understand. Um, <clears throat> to avoid confusion, there's also something called RDF schema. It's also an R a part of a W3C standard, of the RDF standard. Um, despite its name, this is not a schema language. It's a lightweight ontology language, and um, it's partially blending into RDF these days anyway. Um, so this is not a schema language, but uh, something that you used to... Um, describe uh, terminological information about your um, knowledge model inside the knowledge model itself. Whereas Shekel and Checks are really constrained languages on top of the knowledge model that are used to um, mostly define syntactic requirements that you have on your specification. <clears throat> right. So these are two schema languages and I want to give you a quick view of both of these without um, giving very much details. I mean, you could have full videos on each of those, but I think this would go a bit far here. So Shackle is uh, the shapes constraints constraint language and aptly chosen acronym, which uh, gives us a good notion of something being constrained. Um, basic principle of this uh, <clears throat> standard are that Essentially, it's very similar to this query-based unit testing that I just informally described to you. So 
um, <clears throat> you have uh, what is called a shape in Shekel. This is the basic building block and each shape specifies two different aspects. The first is a pattern that RDF graph nodes may match simply is, is akin to simple queries. So you can have more powerful expressions, but um, these standard patterns are relatively simple. Um, and the second part of such a shape is then a specification that uh, tells you which nodes in the graph this shape, this, this query should match to. So what does the pattern actually apply to? <clears throat> and uh, this is all. Uh, you can have many such shapes, but uh, the patterns have, have many expressive features that you can describe there, as have these target node specifications. And um, together you get then a lot of uh, unit tests which can possibly be interrelated. <clears throat> there is a Shackle Sparkle extension where the first part is generalized to be arbitrary Sparkle and not just simple queries. And um, you can have metadata with the shape. So um, you can, for example, have specific error messages or assign severity levels to your um, test cases so that you have a bit more uh, control over what um, <coughs> you obtain when, when running these tests and what you can report to users. Um, all of this information is then stored in RDF as shape graphs. So Shackle uses RDF as its syntax for better or worse. Um, there are some resources you can check out if you want to know more. Actually, especially this book has very detailed documentation on Shackle and checks. Okay, so that's Shackle. Now um, I will just show you an example to give you an idea of how this works. So this is an RDF graph in turtle notation. I don't declare the prefixes um, to, to keep it somewhat brief. And uh, this defines a shape, which I call the person shape. So the idea is that this applies to persons or to nodes that represent persons in our knowledge graph. So here's a person shape. It's of type node shape. So this is a shape. And then I use these turtle abbreviations to um, reuse the same subject. So it has a certain target class, meaning that everything which in the graph is typed to be a person should satisfy this person shape. So this is how we relate the requirements to certain nodes. This is taking the place of what we ha would have with query-based unit testing. You would have to specify what kind of result you expect. And here, um, this uh, is put up front. You say uh, up front which nodes you expect to satisfy the query that you are giving. So this is um, similar to the other approach, but in a different order. <clears throat> And then you define what this person shape should satisfy. The first thing is a sh property block. Um, this is using here the syntax with the brackets. It looks like a nested block. Of course, you know in reality in RDF this is not a block. This is just a blank node which is connected as a object to sh property here, and then is the subject of several other triples inside here, just as we learned for turtle. Um, but writing it like this makes it look as if you were working here in a hierarchical uh, document format, like an XML, which of course RDF is not, which is also why it's not particularly well suited to define these kind of things. I mean, parsing this could be, is, is yeah, expensive, obviously, because uh, you could also have this in any other format with any other order of the triples inside your file. It doesn't have to look at all like this, where you have the feeling that there's a block here. This triple could be at the end of the file after a million other triples, and it still should be taken into account here. <clears throat> okay, so what do we say here in this property um, block? We say that there is a path, which is just a single property, the property which I call SSN. It's an identification number, which you could assign to persons. Um, there should be at most one such number per persons. The data type is a string. I say it's an identification number, but like many numbers of identification, like the ISBN number for books, for example, it in reality is a string, it's not a number. And uh, it should conform to a certain pattern, which I give here as a regular expression. Uh, so this is a requirement for this property SSN. And in addition, I say there should also be a property works for where the, there's no data type, but here the, no, the kind of nodes that this links to is an II. 
uh, and this IRI should further be in the class company. So RDF type company should be applied to whatever is uh, this property works for us po pointing to. Then I say um, <clears throat> this pattern is closed, this shape is closed, so there are no other properties allowed than the, be, besides the two I have here, with the exception of RDF type, which I ignore. Okay, so you see many things can be done here. It's um, Overall, not very difficult. As I said, the resources I linked to, they are giving many examples of how this could be done. So it's it's relatively easy um, to uh, format this. But then the question is, what is your tool scape around that? I think that's a bit more important than the plain syntax of this. Okay, so this is how Shackle looks and roughly what it can do. Now, <clears throat> shapes in Shackle, as I showed you, are identified by IRIs that may optionally include the things that I just went through. So the specification of target nodes, I had target class. You could also have some other ways of specifying which parts of your graph you want to this constraint to apply to. Um, you should have a set of property shapes. I had two such blocks in my example, and uh, you have some constraints, for example, uh, whether it's closed or not. Uh, and some aspects which are not part of the validation. For example, you could have a written description of what this test is testing, like a comment. Um, of course, you have seen, I can always put comments in turtle anyway, but these comments are not attached to any node in the turtle. So if you want to have a comment about your shape and you want it to be in the data after it's passed by an RDF parser, you have to make it an explicit triple, of course, and there's a property for that. Okay, <clears throat> there's a rich vocabulary that you can use then to specify all of this. There can be property paths similar to what you have in Sparkle. The property I used in the model I just showed you already was called path. Um, and this is because you can not just have a single property there, but also paths. Um, there are cardinalities. You say you have to have at least three values of this type or at most five or whatever. You can have resource types, data types, RDF classes of four values, as I have shown you. Um, you can even list explicitly which values are allowed. And <clears throat> there uh, are also ways to say that the property values can be anything, but they should not be the same values that are used by some other property. So um, your spouse cannot be your mother. Uh, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> there can also be recursive references to other uh, node types of uh, property values. So uh, you can recursively require that the value is also of a certain shape. And uh, then you have Boolean combinations of all of this. So it can be pretty complex in a certain sense. <clears throat> okay, now on to Shex. Um, Shex is the shape expressions language. Uh, see uh, name they have chosen um, for their for their um, proposal. Um, the basic principles are that the overall approach is similar to matching a grammar description to a graph. Um, how is that supposed to um, work? Well, from your computer science undergraduates, you know how formal grammars work and how you um, are parsing inputs for a certain grammar, in particular for context-free grammars, which we often use to parse programming languages. What you want to do is you want to um, <clears throat> assign the variables to, of the grammar to the actual pieces of strings that you find in your uh, input. And uh, this gives you then a parse tree, which is essential to, um, for example, compiling the uh, program or to um, styling the HTML file, if you think of DOM trees, which are also kind of parse trees. Okay, <clears throat> so this is how grammars work. You give them the word, the string, and they try to interpret the different pieces of the string in terms of the model that you specify as a grammar. And um, checks is somewhat similar in that the constraints are the model <clears throat> and the graph is the word, the input, just that it's not a string in this case. And you are trying to match these things and um, overall find a way to interpret the graph under these shapes. The shapes themselves are also called shapes here, um, like in Shekel. Um, they specify constraints by defining a pattern that refers to, first of all, the required features of the RDF graph, and second, the required patterns matched 
by adjacent nodes. So this is a recursive uh, requirement. And this is also why this is a matching problem. You somehow um, have to find nodes that have these features and then make sure that also the adjacent nodes have certain features and so on and so forth. The validation of checks then tries to consistently map the nodes in the graph to types, so to shapes as defined here in the checks specification, um, usually based on some initial map. So for shackle, I said you essentially are saying which nodes your constraints are applying to for checks. This is not the maybe the typical mode of operation or the main mode of operation conceptually at least but it's also possible for checks to specific specify which nodes you want to start with and i think these days you can do it in almost the same way as in shackle <clears throat> now uh, sets of shapes together then are called a schema and they are encoded in an rdf inspired but own syntax so not an rdf <clears throat> Again, there's information here, and again, there's a nice book that you can check out if you want to learn about this at any point in more detail. <coughs> Checks by example. The following defines a shape, person shape, without prefix declaration, which is functionally equivalent to what we just saw in Shekel. And what you immediately see without going into the detail is how strikingly short this is now compared to what we just saw for Shekel, where I needed the whole slide to show you the specification. Here it is extremely compact. And this is possible because the syntax is not RDF, but just RDF-like, but um, custom syntax just for shapes. So you have um, here a person shape, closed extra. I will dis explain that in a minute. And it has a certain type, and then there's a brace not an RDF uh, style symbol. And you say there should be a CSSN property, which links to strings of this pattern. And there's a question mark, which um, says something about cardinality. And you say, uh, so zero or one, basically. And you have works for, which is an IRI, which should now um, point to something which is a company shape. A company shape is something which is either a company or <clears throat> something which is an RDF subclass, another company shape. So this is, you see how recursive this is. Company shape points to here and company shape again points to itself. Um, <clears throat> but the uh, statement is still the same as in Shackle before, but we now explicitly navigate the class hierarchy of RDF with this second clause. Closed and extra um, are the same as closed and ignored properties. Um, so I actually wrongly said this is of a certain type, but that the type is not a connection here between person shape and the brace, but it says that there's an extra and this extra is type. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Apologies for that. So this is how this works and closed is, is the closed shapes. Um, the, the properties blocks that have spent many lines in uh, the turtle version of she Shackle are now compactly squeezed into single lines, which has some advantages for readability, but of course could also have um, disadvantages maybe, if you like the verbose version more. Um, and if, for taking such things like typing into account, so the instance of a subclass, one has to use recursion explicitly, which was not necessary in Shekel. In Shekel, I just said a company um, or the things that somebody works for must be a company, and this included indirectly all the superclasses of company, as you could have in an ontology. And here, this is not the case. Um, <clears throat> There are many, many further features, which I don't list here. Uh, and uh, one is that you can use Boolean operators like I have here already um, to combine these uh, conditions. Right, so this is Shex. Uh, and now you know Shex and Shekel. Of course, the big question is how can we actually validate this? And after you have heard about the query language uh, that I have discussed at length here in these videos, um, you may also ask how hard is it actually to evaluate these? And uh, of course, we already know if you use full-fledged Sparkle, things are not completely easy. Sparkle is a powerful language. It could have difficult queries, but this is your choice how to do that. P-Space um, complete in combined complexity. But for data complexity, Sparkle is efficient. It's still in... Um, 
and log space, meaning that um, as your data grows, the query still will need only moderately more resources to be uh, answered, at least in theory. Okay, how is it now with um, shackle and checks? Well, uh, no, let me go out of the way. So both approaches support recursion. So you can recursively require constraints for adjacent nodes. And you also have disjunctions, which means you can say a node should have either this or that shape it corresponds to without being specific about which one it should be. And uh, this introduces problems because it makes it hard for um, a validating um, tool to check if these constraints are really satisfied because it's to be satisfied one of the two options has to be there but each of them might require other things to be satisfied nearby and there again might be options so in the end you might end up trying out many combinations of options until you find one that works um, <clears throat> so uh, there is non-determinism inside uh, this and uh, there is the possibility that you have no types that are not part of the data so not all the requirements that you have are directly uh, grounded in the nodes that they have to refer to. But some of them might indirectly be uh, imposed on nodes by the fact that a nearby node has to satisfy certain requirements. And these two aspects together mean that uh, actually the worst case complexity is NP-complete. And it's actually NP-complete in the size of the graph, which means its uh, data complexity is NP. Um, that, which is not a favorable property to have, to be honest. I mean, as I said, Sparkle is P-space complete, but not in data. It's just the size of your queries that have this um, complexity behavior. And your queries can be restricted in size. But uh, for data, this is not the case. Your data will always grow and you want it to grow. This is the prospects that you have when you start a knowledge graph project. And so you have to be somewhat concerned about this. But of course, only if you use uh, features in certain ways, and uh, it might well be possible to avoid dangerous feature combinations in practice so that the tool still scales well. <clears throat> in particular, in Shackle, these recursive assignments are actually rather minor feature, and the specification itself does not even officially define their semantics. So um, most of the selection ta of target nodes is explicitly done by using conditions on the RDF. For example, saying this shape has to be applied to all the things which are in class person. And so if you do it like this, um, checking is much easier, much more local. Then it's really like the query-based unit testing approach that I uh, mentioned. <coughs> in checks, at least conceptually, this is not what people started with. They had these, um, the there are only type maps as a mechanism for selecting targets. And um, recursive assignments are unavoidable at if you want to do things like indirect class membership checks. So at least for some cases, you don't get around the recursion. You have to live with it. And tools have to be optimized to, be po to support this case uh, more efficiently maybe than what would be possible in general if you... Um, have to deal with such problems. So my personal impression is that this complexity is a bigger challenge for checks than for shackle if you implement it by the book. But in practice, your mileage may vary. So it's uh, definitely worth trying out these things with actual um, tools. <coughs> um, a final remark, since shackle is mostly deterministic, it can also provide detailed error reports in case of failing constraints. Um, this is an issue because like with any NP complete problem, um, failing to find a solution is something that is very hard to explain to users. So if you find a good solution to an NP complete problem, the very nature of NP is that the solution can be explained in a concise and small and compact way. Yeah, so think uh, Sudoku puzzles. Uh, if you have a, such, a, such a game, if I fill it out for you, it's easy for you to check if uh, it's correct or not. Or think of um, knowledge graph uh, examinations. If I fill it out for you and I ask you to check if my results are correct, it's much easier than if you have to answer it yourself. Um, so uh, these are NP um, type problems, but if for some reason you are presented with a problem in, in an NP uh, uh, situation where uh, or with an instance of an NP problem, I should say, where there is no answer, like the constraints cannot be matched to the data. 
it is very difficult to tell the user why, because essentially the explanation is because I tried these exponentially many ways and it, oh, none of them work. And um, that's not concise and that's not a very helpful error report. If you have deterministic assignments, it's much easier. You can say, okay, this node is in class person, but it didn't have an SSN number of the right shape. And then it's uh, it's a clear, clearly defined error report because there's no choice how to interpret the constraint. So it's clear why it has been violated. And so in this sense, I think this is also more useful potentially. Okay, right. So that was it about knowledge graph quality. We have seen it's not completely easy, but there are technologies, there are ways to start uh, if you um, want to approach this problem. Now, in the following videos, at the very end of this little course, I want to uh, briefly talk a bit about graph analysis, a slightly different topic. Um, PageRank uh, will feature there and some other things um, that uh, also sometimes comes up when people talk about knowledge graphs. So um, thanks for listening and see you soon. Bye-bye.